Samir, I'd like to hand over to you now. Okay. Samir is going to talk about stabilization and humanitarian action in Pakistan. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to briefly talk about the relationship between stabilization and the impact that it's had on humanitarian action in Pakistan. And some of the findings that I'll be discussing today are really based on a series of workshops that we carried out in Islamabad and in Peshawar in um, June this year. And um, so mainly referred to the situation prior to the large-scale flooding this summer. Um, so essentially in 2009, what we see is that the, um, the Pakistan government and military with international support um, carries out a series of offensives that try to aim to eliminate um, what they see as the threats from militants in the tribal areas that border Afghanistan and Pakistan, but also in more settled areas such as the, um, the Swat Valley. And, um, and in line with international thinking on um, stabilization, there has been attempts by the military and the government to find greater coherence between different spheres of intervention, so include the kind of security, the harder side of intervening, but also with the kind of more softer sides, which includes development, peace building, humanitarian action. Now, in terms of humanitarian assistance, it essentially means using emergency health, education, shelter, water, sanitation, and provision of food as critical building blocks in enhancing stability. So it's part of a, a clear, hold, and build strategy that essentially means that once they clear an area of militants, they, um, they force civilians to flee to displacement camps or to reside in host communities. Um, they provide assistance to those camps and to the host families, and then they provide um, assistance again to the civilians once they return to those areas. So the idea is that this assistance serves to enhance the legitimacy of the government and its international supporters. It undermines support for rival factions, so in this case the militants, and the, the, the idea is that also that the improved security um, opens up the space for recovery and longer term development. Now, in order to ensure this coherence between the hard and softer side of interventions, the government formed a coordination body which was called the Special Support Group. And it was, although it was a civilian institution, it was, heading by, it was headed by a serving officer. Now, from the military perspective, they didn't really see a problem be, um, between military and humanitarian coordination, and the military played a significant role in delivering assistance, and also alongside political authorities determining whether humanitarian organizations had access to certain areas, often through uh, non-objection certificates, which is the requirements for agencies for, to have access. Now, the military didn't really understand the objections that were arising because from their perspective, there was significant coordination during the 2005 earthquake response, and generally the military were praised for doing quite a good job. But also, they saw the military imperative of the stabilization efforts kind of representing the greater good. So that is, it's a means to providing longer-term security and protection to Pakistani civilians that have been affected by terrorism, highlighting, highlighting that there's no humanitarian solutions to humanitarian problems. Now, um, now, I, this has been quite problematic in practice because the reality is that the priority for the military is very much about enhancing state security and not protection. And I think it's important to distinguish between the two. Now, for example, in terms of enhancing security, um, you see the fact that there was a heavy military presence in some of the camps, often to try to filter um, any suspected militants. Um, sometimes the returns weren't 100% voluntary, so sometimes coerced despite um, conditions on the ground being of concern to both the populations and to the humanitarian community. Community. Um, civilians were often killed by the excessive use of force during these military operations, and there were often cases of arbitrary and extrajudicial killings that took place with very little accountability. Furthermore, the government essentially denied that a conflict existed and tried to label its activities as law enforcement operations, which has the effect of denying the application of international humanitarian law, as well as other frameworks that I establish. Um, when there's deemed to be an armed conflict, such as engagement between both sides of a conflict. And this is an area where there has been very limited space for humanitarian organizations to engage with non-state armed actors. And mainly because the, um, the authorities do not want to enhance the legitimacy of these actors, so they do not want them to be engaging with humanitarians. Um, and you see that strategy clearly in other contexts as well. So you see that in Afghanistan, in Colombia, and in Somalia, in other stabilization contexts. Now, um, similarly, there was a lot of alarm when other relief organizations that had suspected ties to Islamic organizations or Islamic political parties were delivering relief, um, seeing them essentially as fighting on alternative hearts and mind battles and therefore was something to counter rather than um, looking at the assistance that they were providing and the needs that they were meeting that weren't being met elsewhere. Um, 
furthermore, w the denial that a conflict actually exists plays down the actual humanitarian emergency. So the government was very keen to emphasize the fact that they had reached an early recovery phase, that there was um, space for longer term development. And earlier this year, during the spring, a post crisis needs assessment was established in order to determine funds for a World Bank um, administered fund, which there wasn't really a lot of um, knowledge about when it would actually release the funds. So I wasn't sure whether it was actually an effective mechanism to bridge the gap between the humanitarian phase and the recovery and development phase. Now, this raised a lot of concerns amongst the humanitarian community, particularly the Pakistan Humanitarian Forum, because by the spring last year, the, um, the Pakistan Humanitarian Response Plan was only 12% funded, and they felt that a lot of the funding instead was going to the more recovery, development-orientated activities. Now, linking the humanitarian effort to the stabilization effort has also affected the impartiality of assistance so from a military perspective some populations are deemed more valuable than others so in contrast to the, the principle of humanity they can distinguish between the non-expendable and those that can be sacrificed in the construction of political order more broadly now in practice that has seen more attention being given to humanitarian needs in settled areas um, such as the Swat Valley as opposed to in tribal areas with some of those areas falling under the frontier crisis Regulation Act, which is essentially an act that excludes populations on the basis of collective punishment. So this had implications for delivering assistance to the Mesud and the Bitani tribes. Um, also, in areas that were adjacent to what were considered kind of areas of operations, they were not considered, the populations in those areas were not allowed to register for humanitarian assistance because they were deemed to be outside of the conflict zone. However, they had legitimate reasons often to flee because they felt that there was a conflict could spread, but were not allowed, were not um, entitled to assistance. Um, now, the humanitarian community at the start of the crisis developed these basic operating rules, so emphasizing a principled approach to given the fact that there were such challenges in the context. But there didn't really seem to be any kind of take up on the, um, the basic operating rules, and essentially kind of fell down the, um, the, wayside, the wayside, and no one really ref seemed to refer them to anymore if they even knew that they existed. Now, um, this is in line, I think, with a general lack of willingness among the humanitarian community, particularly the UN, to really challenge the government and the military on this, their stabilization policy. So, for example, the World, the World Food Program was very happy to provide assistance on the basis of government registration, despite knowing that there was discrimination and populations were excluded despite high levels of vulnerability. Um, also, there's very little advocacy done to really push for greater distinction between military and humanitarian responses, very little advocacy on protection issues, and there was very little advocacy to, of, to try to create the space for engaging with non-state armed actors. Now, I think this was partly due to the fact that the UN, prior to the crisis, was um, piloting the One UN approach, which very much promotes um, greater partnerships with the government. And I think the UN very much saw the crisis as a temporary phenomenon, and therefore didn't really want to jeopardize relationships with the government. So once the, the crisis was over, they could continue once again with good partnerships with the government. Um, on civil military guidelines, I mean, these were eventually put together, but a year after the crisis. And some of the people we spoke to complained that the process was not very consultative and that at the time that we were doing the workshops, the, um, the civil military guidelines were given to the military for approval. But I guess that kind of reflects a greater tendency, I think, among the humanitarian community to want to regulate the behaviors of others. But I think in terms of guidelines, they're not necessarily about regulating the behavior of the military, but very much about rela reg regulating the behavior of the humanitarian communities and trying to find common positions and red lines. And I think more investment should have been done in trying to establish those common positions and red lines with regard to the military, as opposed to really trying to get approval from the military, which was not really forthcoming. Um, and when there has been discussions about um, civil military relations, it has been very kind of tactical. So in a sense, you know, do we in this instance use a uh, military helicopter to deliver assistance to this particular area, rather than really looking at the bigger picture and kind of seeing how the humanitarian enterprise was essentially being co-opted into a larger stabilization strategy. And I think that raises some of the concerns that Amani was uh, <coughs> mentioning around how the humanitarian project is perceived. Um, now, I think this pragmatism is part, 
well, part of the reason why the humanitarian project is seen as very, very basically a Western endeavor. And I think whilst it's not the only reason, I think it probably plays a part in the reason why there's been greater hostility towards humanitarian organizations and uh, a rise in incidences of attacks. Now, the response to that, and I think to make matters worse, has been very much to focus on protection and deterrence strategies at the expense of acceptance strategies. So the UN are increasingly building walls and establishing themselves in fortified aid compounds and um, using armed escorts. Now, sometimes these are enforced by the government, but other times they are voluntarily. And whilst there's often a perception that there's no space for pushback um, to not use military escorts, there has been organizations that have been able to negotiate um, not using escorts or using it in a way that's less obvious. Um, so I think some of these policies create barriers and sometimes literally between humanitarians and the people they claim to support. So it leads to very little kind of engagement uh, around explaining what the humanitarian project is, what the values are, and how to create general acceptance. Um, now, many of the NGOs, whilst they haven't you know, used such... Um, such extreme, I would say, security measures, um, they mainly work through remote management, so working through lo with local NGOs <coughs> implementing some of the projects. And some of these local NGOs, they do not have humanitarian backgrounds, but have taken advantage of the demand there is for humanitarian implementation of the project. So some of the ones that we were speaking to actually have a background in counter-radicalization and take very different approaches to some of the issues Say to, to give one example around civil military um, um, relations and how they should um, engage with the military and also because they have particular pressures. So because they come from areas, if the military asks them to have a look at their beneficiary lists because they want to take people off their list that they suspect to have links with um, militant family members, they often feel that they're obliged to and that also, they have the, 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 um, the pressures of actually having to implement the project. And if they are going to engage in some of these kind of red lines that the, the humanitarian community would like to, they feel that that would jeopardize their ability to actually implement. Um, now, in terms of a lot of the critiques of the humanitarian response in Pakistan have been very much focused on the humanitarian coordinator level, highlighting the lack of effective leadership. And whilst I think this is true to a certain extent, I think it presumes that there's an actual system in place in which that if you had effective leadership, the system would work well and would be able to respond to some of these challenges. But I think the reality is more complex and we do not have a system in per se, but or at least not a coherent one. So in the sense that there's no governing authority on the system and it's formed by very different networks with have various incentives for collaboration. So this is very evident even within the UN where you have different UN agencies that don't report directly to the humanitarian coordinator but they um, respond to their headquarters and the humanitarian coordinator is often ahead of an agency themselves so it's they're seen often sometimes to be compromised. Um, so whilst common positions were often agreed upon in humanitarian um, coordination meetings, in practice, organizations would go and violate them. So this was particularly the case with issues of civil-military relations, where they would agree common positions around not, for example, using a military <laughs> helicopter, but then an organization would then just go and do it. Similarly, where in terms of supporting returns, there would be concerns that the returns were not voluntary, but organizations would, and there would be agreement not to support the returns, but then some organizations would go and do it. Now, some colleagues um, here at HPG have been doing some work on looking at networks within the humanitarian system, and, um, and they tried to de depict a small sample of these networks in a diagram. And just to show you the diagram, it's, um, <laughs> which is quite painful to the eye at first sight, but the, um, essentially what it tries to do is link, uh, list a few different networks on the side there and show how they're interrelated or not interrelated with the dotted lines being the informal relations and the actual th thick lines being the formal relations. And it just shows you that rather than having kind of a coherent coordinated system, in fact that it's more characterized by contestation and fragmentation. And therefore, I think that that can be a good thing in the sense that it can be, create flexibility and diversity within the system. It can respond to diff different challenges. There's space for innovation. But then I think at the same time, it also creates a disjointed et enterprise, particularly when there is a need for collective action to respond to some of the processes of politicization. Um, 
So this is, raises the question of whether the actual humanitarian system, the way it's formed now, is actually in a position to effectively respond to some of these challenges. And I know, for example, Medicine Sans Frontières in Pakistan have decided very much to step out of the system, has very much decided to drop the label of NGO because they feel that that associates them. So I, I guess my question to kind of finalize is very much whether the future for, human, for principled humanitarian action is taking that route about really separating um, from the greater system or